dawn, and uh, I hope uh, we'll be able to wake you up. So I'm uh, uh, David Majid, I'm uh, a Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Moose College London, and it's my honor and privilege really to chair this session for really eminent writers. Um, and I think they're all well known, so I'll only say a little bit about each of them. So, uh, Susan Abu Hava is a, is a Palestinian American writer who's the author of a number of uh, important novels, and she's also an activist, spent uh, time in refugee camps, um, and has drawn attention to the plight of Palestinians in many international forums. Uh, Mona Al Tahawi, sorry if I that, is a powerful voice for women's uh, rights in the Arab and Muslim world and for human rights in the Islamic world. Um, as many of you know, she was detained in Cairo in 2011 and uh, assaulted by the police. Um, and uh, she wrote a famous essay, Why Do They Hate Us?, which has now become a book. Um, called Headscarves and Hymens. Uh, and interestingly, that essay begins with a reference to a short story, which is quite uh, interesting for our family. Um, Soraya Khan is a well-known Pakistani-American novelist, Pakistani novelist whose um, works deal with traumatic events in Pakistan history and uh, the 20th century in general. And um, that's one of the other things we might discuss in this uh, panel, which is the relationship, that really the tense relationship between writers and the nation state. And last but not, not least, Mohsin Hamid, who is the author of a number of very well-known novels, the most famous of which is The Reluctant Fundamentalist, which The Guardian actually described as one of the books that defined the decade. Uh, and his novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, I intend to read as a manual because I'm a poor academic and I really need to get the rich. So, um, so let me. Um, so thank you very much for being here, and let me so begin with the title of the panel, um, the shackle of politics. Because I guess in some ways politics is a shackle, but in other ways it's uh, empowering. It empowers people to write, to speak the truth to power. And I guess the first general issue you might want to discuss is that uh, kind of ambiguity of politics. Politics as oppression and politics as liberation and how it translates into your writing. And then secondly, maybe one thing when as a teacher of literature I find interesting is to how, how can you prevent politically committed literature from not becoming propaganda? So perhaps uh, we could begin uh, with you, Surya, about uh, the question of politics as a shackle and politics as liberating. working, sort of. <laughs> um, well, in regards to the question about uh, politics as oppression or liberation in my writing, I guess I feel that uh, I, I perceive politics as being liberating in a sense because I feel like the politics of the historical context is, is the context for my writing and therefore it frames it and it's liberating to me to examine characters within that um, larger milieu. <laughs> and so in a sense, um, I am interested in how, in how politics manifests in the stories of individuals. Yeah. And that is both liberating and also has an um, oppressive angle to it as well. Right. And um, what, uh, well, maybe if we turn to you, Susan, um, so, I, I don't really see a separation, to be honest, between art and politics. Okay. I, mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't find that you know very clear delineation that people seem to see. Um, and 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 frankly, when I'm writing, um, I really have 
know loyalty to, to the politics, and it's not something I feel constrained by. I am I'm really interested in examining people's lives, um, and even you know, and we all exist in a political context and a political framework. Um, and so, so my focus is really on my characters and, and on my life. Where I do feel sort of the quote shackles of politics is is really from the perception of my writing. Mm. And it, you know, inevitably, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm necessarily, it seems, because I'm Palestinian viewed as a, as a political writer. And so I feel like when people review uh, my works of fiction, um, they, the focus is on the political context. And, and in some ways, I feel like it's another layer of how we are so objectified. Yeah. That, that, you know, we like, there's so little commentary on the human lives um, that, I, that I really focus on. I put a, pour, pour a lot of love and emotion into. Um, and it's, it's always on this sort of abstract political concepts that people sort of reflect in, in their reviews. And, and it's a bit frustrating because it does feel like we're objectified. And a couple of examples, like, Actually, on a panel yesterday, um, uh, I mean, I was told that you know m my novel feels uh, angry, and then um, and in a, a previous review from from the South African, um, a white South African uh, reviewer who who reviewed two Palestinian books. One was my novel, and one was um, a nonfiction sort of travel log by someone who sort of went to Gaza, and um, and and to her, she said that. She said that my novel is too cheerful. Mm. It, was, it was too human. Because, and so basically, and to me, I feel like you know these people, readers, have this idea of what Palestinians are like, mm. and they don't want to let go of them. Mm. And and they will either see it, they'll see the anger and, and these things that they, the ideas that they have about us, they'll see it and 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 whatever I write, no matter what I write, um, or they. Um, uh, or, or they or they'll dismiss it because mm. if, if it doesn't conform to, to the tragedy. So we are either angry and political or we're tra sad, tragic things. And I think that that comes, those are the shackles I feel. And it's mostly from, from perception, from readers, and not so much what I feel writing. Mm. So that, that's really interesting. I, I think both what um, Soraya and Susan have said about, um, I mean, two things that in a sense you find the politics in your writing as a process. Can you hear? Yeah. It's not that you know, begin with um, a political idea and then embody it in your writings. It's more that the political emerges in the course of your writing. And the second thing is how you're received. And I wonder, uh, Mohsen and Mona, whether um, you find the shackle of politics in work always being. always being read as political allegory alone. Because I know some novelists, I mean like Amos Oz, I hate to bring him up, but he actually wrote a piece about how as an Israeli writer, or, and Barghouti I know also kind of uh, uh, gets annoyed about this, that they're constantly, they're, they feel their work is constantly being reduced to political allegory. And how do you feel about that? Do you find that, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I, uh, I struggle to see, in a way, how you can you know, separate politics out of what human beings do and create and talk about. And, um, you know, whenever you have a person interacting with another person or thinking about other people, politics enters um, in. And, uh, you know, for me, that, that there, there is no unpolitical writing. Um, that all writing is political. It's just perhaps that some writers might choose to dissociate themselves from the politics that seems to be present in their work. So some works are, as it were, unconsciously political. Well, I don't know unconsciously or not, but I think that there's... Um, uh, uh, that um, in this debate between you know art on the one hand and politics on the other, uh, uh, it's 
I've always found the position that of art being non-political it's a very difficult position to understand. Yeah. You know, it's like saying, you know, uh, this person is non-sexual or, you know, uh, uh, I mean, has no skin color or you know, just these things. Uh, whether we want to make something of it about this, you know, but it exists. Um, as far as, you know, the idea of it being a constraint or liberation, um, one of the nice things about living and writing in Pakistan, uh, as I do, is um, I'm not entirely uh, uh, concerned or, or um, I perhaps don't dwell as much on the idea that people in the United States or in Britain or in some other country find me to be a political or a political writer. Um, I think there are many different types of readers in America, but yeah. they have many different types of reactions. Um, but in any case, uh, the fact that you know reviewers in one country or another regard my work to be in one category isn't the be all end. Um, uh, in Pakistan, I've almost never had people come up to me and say, you know, you are a sort of political mm. writer. Um, uh, even though very often conversations about it, my novels and novels generally, or fiction generally, um, becomes political conversation. Um, and I think, I think uh, what that sort of comes to is that uh, in many places, the existing structure of power is thought to be deeply problematic. Yeah. And so anything which is contesting what the structure is, yeah. it comes very natural, uh, naturally. Um, in other places, perhaps, there's much more power behind the existing structure of power, and therefore any writing or fiction that challenges that is identified as political. Um, and, uh, and I think in Pakistan, I haven't met anybody who thinks that the system of power in Pakistan is particularly pleasant or makes sense. Um, uh, so, I mean, the last thing I'd say is that, is that um, uh, it may well be that certain reviewers or commentators upon, you know, on, uh, on the fiction of people who might come from a place like Palestine or Pakistan or whatever. Um, it, in fact, it is those re reviewers and commentators who are a bit more shackled by the social politics because yeah. it, it narrows their lens of looking at, at how somebody is expressing themselves and what they have to say. Yeah. Okay. Much more than the writer, you know, him or herself, who is just uh, uh, expressing, you know, yeah. what, what they're going to do. Oh, thank you. And Mona? What, what? Um, I'm, hello. Yeah. I'm very consciously political in my writing. I mean, I started, uh, I'm the only non, I, I'm the only non-fiction writer on the panel. I don't write fiction. Um, I, it's one of those things that I'm in total awe of, and maybe one of these days I will write fiction. But I'm, I'm a very, very non-fiction writer. I've actually began my writing career as a journalist. And as a journalist that covered very political issues, so I was a Reuters correspondent in Cairo and in Jerusalem. So I was covering the Mubarak regime. I was covering horrendous human rights violations that were happening in the Mubarak regime. And I was in Jerusalem on the Palestinian week. So I was covering you know, Palestinian life, basically. I, I would go to Gaza and I would go to the West Bank and refugee camps uh, regularly and got into a lot of trouble with the Egyptian regime because I lived in Jerusalem. So my writing, my, my journalism was, was always about politics. It, it wasn't about, I, and, and very consciously so. And I think it was because when I, when I was a teenager, my family moved to Saudi Arabia from the UK. I'm from Egypt. And being in Saudi Arabia at that young age and, and seeing what was happening around me, seeing how my mom, who, and who had just got a PhD with my dad in the UK, was reduced to this person that had to be driven around, even though you know, she, was a, she was teaching medical students in, the, in, in Saudi, just as my dad was. And taking that all in as a 15-year-old as a just you know, made my... First of all, set me to a deep depression and made my brain go, what the fuck is going on in this country? Because that's not any, you know, any kind of slam that I grew up with. So um, journalism for me became a way out of that, became a way to fight back. And so when I moved back to Cairo, I moved back to Cairo to study journalism and, and very consciously latched on to, like I said, the little bar of regime and its human rights violations. And then when I moved to the US, um, the, the shift that my, the, the political shift that my writing took there, was that a year after I moved to the US, and 9-11 attacks happened. And my what the fuck moment there was, I was watching on television a parade of 
you know, I mean, yesterday, I will call him again because Donald Trump just went to South Carolina primary, and, and like I said, he's a racist fascist fuck. And when I moved to the US, I was seeing a parade of racist fascist fucks on television, um, talking about Muslims that, that I didn't know, but then also seeing Muslims that were being paraded on television, talking in a way that I would never talk. So it was either, you know, ultra-conservative Muslim men, or women in headscarves talking to me, or racist fascist fucks. Or, and then when, when the invasion of Iraq happened, Americans talking to each other about whether they supported George Bush or not. So I, I did not want to be a reporter in that context at all because I, like, objectivity was just blown out of the water. There's no such thing as objectivity. So I became an opinion writer. And again, an opinion writer who used I in a very political context. So I began to write about what it was like for me as a feminist, as a Muslim, as a woman, as all those identifiers but then that took me into, into a whole different kind of political trouble because very much like you say, Susie, to be a Muslim woman writer is, I mean, is, a, is the embodiment of all kinds of politics. I mean, my body, whether it's, I'm talking about um, the hijab or not and how I took off the hijab, uh, anything I say is bound to be used by the right wing against Muslim men and anything I say doesn't want to be heard by the left wing because they want to be politically correct and cultural relativists and all of that. So it's like the, the, your mere existence as a Muslim woman writer, whether you're a fiction writer or a non-fiction writer, is inherently political. And so the opinion writing took me, took me into kind of like those um, uh, dangerous, treacherous waters, if you like. And more recently, my writing has become much more consciously sexual, mm. because that for me is kind of like the next level of, of politics in my writing. And um, I'll stop there and I'll talk about the sex more, because I'm sure you're going to bring up that short story. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, thank you, those are very interesting comments, and I guess that uh, beginning, uh, you know, kind of ending on the sexual is interesting, because I wanted to take us back a couple of thousand years to Plato's Republic, because Plato in his Republic, it's a very interesting text, he actually bans poets and artists from his ideal city-state. So he makes certain arguments against art and poetry, and says this is why the poets and artists should be uh, Hashur and have a place in the ideal political state in his utopia. And I just want to, uh, you know, he makes four arguments, and I just want to begin with one argument, and I, because basically what many of you are talking about is justice. And you're talking about how literature in many different ways can intervene in justice, and how, how it can create justice, possibilities for justice, and uh, so on. And one of the things Plato says is that poetry, poetry and literature don't really help us to understand the nature of justice or the nature of beauty. They give us many beautiful images, they give us images of justice, but they don't really help to clarify the concept of justice. Naturally, only philosophers like him can do that. So they don't really give us the tools to create a just society or to clarify what justice actually is. Um, so that was one of his arguments against poets and writers. I wonder what your response would be to that. Uh, um, you know, how how might you, uh, God forbid, if Plato was here, how would you reply to him? Um, Mosin, would you like to? Um, you know, uh, sometimes you get the feeling uh, that that, uh, that aspect of Plato's Republic is alive and well in the Republic. Of Pakistan. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's not clear that, that our guardians particularly like the long for example. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that uh, um, it's not correct to say that, that art cannot give us insight into justice, and in, in, in multiple ways. You know, one is the way that um, uh, any sort of unitary view of how the world should be is inherently flawed. Yeah. So, uh, by just expanding the types of views, yeah. um, we arrive at something, you know, more cacophonous. That's a bit more like um, justice. But uh, part of it is, you know, I think of stuff that I've read over the years. Um, if I think of reading, you know, Primo Levi on on uh, Auschwitz or Toni Morrison on um, the experience of the after slavery in the United States or um, Manto on uh, partition. Um, you know, writing and art creates empathy. Yeah. Um, it allows you to feel 
something of what somebody else might be feeling yeah. and to associate yourself with that feeling. And, and to me, there's an, an enormous aspect of, of empathy in, in justice. Um, I think it, you know, justice without empathy is, is tyranny. Yeah. Um, and so that, so that would be, you know, uh, one part of it. Um, the last thing I would say as far as, as far as justice is concerned is that I think, you know, feelings matter. Yeah. Um, we can't simply make rational arguments as though we were mathematical systems and say that this yeah. is how, you know, humanity must organize itself. Yeah. People feel things. Yeah. And there's wisdom and truth in what feelings uh, express. There's also horror and, and bigotry in what feelings express. Yeah. But, but it's an entire vocabulary of human experience, you know, how people feel, yeah. um, that, is, that is vital. Yeah. And very often in moments of injustice, what we see is that the way that large numbers of people feel is being marginalized or excluded or not being allowed to express itself. Yeah. And so I think, I think this um, overly rationalistic approach to justice, we don't want a purely feeling-based approach to justice in the sense that, you know, um, how do we debate or discuss no. or, you know, our, our feelings, but, but we can't remove feeling from yeah. it. And, and I think, you know, uh, I mean, living in Pakistan, um, the last thing I'd say on this is, as far as justice is concerned, um, you know, I often feel that, that in this country that we exist in a state of, of sort of collective depression. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that there's, there's a real, in Pakistan, this real sadness. Um, and depression has been defined as, um, as the failure to imagine a plausible, desirable future yeah. for oneself. Mm -hmm. And I think, in fact, much of the world is, is gripped by depression. And one of the things that, that the arts can do is imagine alternative futures. Yeah. And some of those futures might be um, more plausible and more desirable. Yeah. Or just by imagining them, they become plausible. And the desirability is something you yourself will decide for yourself. Yeah. Um, and that is one way out of this depression. I, I've also been to Saudi Arabia one time, and I remember being horrified, you know, by this place. It's the first time I went somewhere and, and came back to Pakistan and said, you know, I live in this enlightened land of, you know, <laughs> democracy and tolerance and women's rights. I mean, it was a strange yeah. uh, experience, um, but, uh, you know, horrifying uh, experience. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, you, the one thing that was very interesting to me about Saudi Arabia was I went into a music wow. shop. And in this music shop, there's no music playing. You could buy <laughs> the music and you could take it back into your home or inner sanctum and listen to the music, but you yeah. couldn't listen to music publicly. Yeah. That's interesting because I think one of the things um, authoritarianism is worried about is also, uh, finds worrying about the power of art is pleasure. Because I think pleasure is so often transgressive and so often subversive of. Uh, you know, fixed political categories um, and even fixed individuals. Um, and I was wondering, uh, maybe to pick up on your point about empathy and pleasure, um, I mean, in a sense, uh, would you agree, uh, Susan, that in a sense the important thing about art is the creation of empathy and empathy is actually both an ethical and a political process which create, which carves out spaces for alternative futures? How might one think about empathy as a, as a political process in art itself? Um, so, you know, the presence of art in every... I mean, uh, Marcin brought up, you know, that the idea of, of, uh, of, of depressed societies yeah. and, and Saudi Arabia. And, and it, it's, it's really societies that uh, limit art, that limit access to music, to literature, and so forth, tend to be um, the least happy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and they, they, they tend to be the least um, progressive in terms of uh, thought, in terms of science and yeah, art, and, yeah. and they, they tend to be the most Maybe limiting really to human good. endeavors and human potential. Um, and the places where, where human potential does flourish are places that, um, that nurture artists and writers and musicians and value them in society. Because art is a place, it's a terrain where human beings um, can meet each other. Yeah. Regardless I think regardless of their background, regardless of, of who they are. And that's that's the process of empathy. 
Yeah. Um, it's a place that that um, provokes thought. Yes. It's a place that asks questions, um, makes us ask questions of ourselves. It's a place where where um, human beings grow spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. Yeah. I believe. Um, and it's 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 a place that inspires us. I mean, I you know think of how we feel, what music does to us, or 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 what it does to us when we are touched by. Um, by a beautiful work of art, or, or by a wonderful novel, or something. I mean, this provocation of emotion, of feeling, this, is, this happens in the terrain of art, and it is integral to every society. It is so important. And, it is, um, and that's why governments that, um, fascist governments, uh, totalitarian governments, are so threatened by artists, and they're so threatened by by literature, uh, yes. because it because this terrain is where uh, is a place where human beings are empowered, where the masses are empowered, yeah. and and totalitarian regimes don't want that. Yeah. So um, yes, I mean, and art is absolutely integral. Yeah, and I think the question of art and pleasure to go back to that. I think one of the hard things to contain and control is pleasure really and I wanted to bring you in Mona because in your powerful piece um, Why Do They Hate Us you actually begin with a short story which is about the lack of pleasure in a sense the piece is inspired by the short story to say actually the right to pleasure is a fundamental human right <laughs> I will uh, I'll tell it when you very briefly what the story is about yeah. it, it's a short story by a wonderful and now departed Egyptian short story writer called Alifa Rifat. And she wrote this amazing collection that is sadly much neglected called Just a View of a Minaret. And, and that's the title of the opening story, and that's the, the story that I use um, as uh, the opening of my essay. And it describes how a woman and her husband are having sex. And he's on top of her, and he's enjoying himself. And she remembers how when they first got married, she was about to orgasm. And and she held on to him and said, you know, don't stop, don't stop. And he was so horrified that she was enjoying sex, a wife and a husband, that he said to her, woman, what are you trying to do to me? Are you trying to kill me? And she said, ever since then, he intentionally made sure that he orgasmed before she did and just rolled over and went to sleep. So she's having sex with her husband, who's kind of looking at the ceiling and saying, oh, there's a cobweb. I should probably sweep that off. And, oh, there's so-and-so. So she lets him finish, and then she gets up, and she goes, and, and the, uh, she hears the other, and she goes and prays, and makes herself a cup of coffee, and sits there and reflects on her life. It is just three pages, but it's jam packed And it becomes obvious that this woman has sublimated all of this uh, frustration and desire that can go nowhere into religion. And then she goes, oh, it's time to make coffee for my husband, and she goes and makes him coffee. And she, she tells us, Alifa Rafat tells us in a short story that the husband insists on this coffee being poured in front of him. So she goes to wake him up. She finds out that he's dead. And she very calmly goes into their son's room and says to him, go call the doctor from downstairs. And she takes the coffee and goes back into the balcony. And in those three pages, it's just like fucking slam dug into your gut. It just captures everything about sexual frustration, about women's right to pleasure, about how women are denied pleasure and how women who express desire are, you know, called everything from a whore to a man eating monster to everything. She doesn't say that, obviously, in so many terms. And, 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 it, and it's so interesting that we're talking about pleasure and joy now because just yesterday in Egypt, under our current fascist dictator, as you can tell, I'm a big fan of the word fascism. I think we should use it more often. <laughs> under our current fascist dictator, Abu Fattah Sisi, not the Muslim Brotherhood, who I detest, by the way. I detest the military and the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Half the Muslim Brotherhood are in jail. And this never happened under Mohammed Morsi. I detested him too. <laughs> but they're all fascists. But yesterday, in Egypt, under Sisi's regime, an Egyptian novelist called Ahmed Nabi was jailed for two years because he wrote a novel that incited debauchery and inflamed people's morals. Now, no Egyptian policeman has been jailed for more than two years for murdering people, but a novel can get you into jail for two years. So that's, that's, that's where the danger of pleasure and joy Yeah, I think that's, that's um, a kind of important point because, um, you know, eroticism in literature is a very powerful um, thing, actually. And 
it kind of addresses the issue that a number of all of you, in fact, have explored in your writing, which is the relationship between intimacy and politics. Um, and I guess another form of pleasure that authoritarian regimes worry about is humor, cartoons, satire, um, uh, you know, comedy. Um, and I, I just wonder, is the fear of humor and humorous literature and cartoons, is that just a fear of being ridiculed or is there something deeper there about the repressive reaction against humor and hu the humorous possibilities of literature? So, Raya, do you have, I wonder what you thought about that. Well, I guess my thought is that the power of humor really is a subversive power, yeah. right? And so, often when we're mocking something in terms of cartoons, we're presenting difficult subjects um, in uncomfortable ways yeah. using humor. Yeah. And I feel like that is a way of making, of commentary is a commentary both possibly in terms of social justice, in terms of also being given the freedom to address silences in our own societies. Um, I feel like humor presents us with that possibility. And there's an incredible power in that. Yeah. That's, well, what, 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 do, uh, what, what, what do you, Susan, do you feel? Um, what do you feel? How do I feel about humor? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I completely agree um, with the that it's a subversive um, tool. I'm not funny, and I envy people who are funny and who have can, who can write funny. And I try, and it never works, and so I don't. And uh, my novels make people cry. I think. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like I said, you know, literature is this vast, wonderful, beautiful, amazing terrain, yeah. and 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 and, and, there, and it's full of all kinds of possibilities, possibilities for humor, for love, for for tears, for for violence, um, questions, sexuality, all these wonderful human endeavors, human potentials, and um, and they all have the potential to subvert power, to subvert repression, to to make us better, to make us evolve spiritually, to make us evolve morally. Um, and and that's, that's just one piece of it, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I guess one of the kind of things that people like uh, Mao and others worried about was that the thing about literature is it is cathartic. I mean, it helps you to experience emotions vicariously, but and to, in, in a sense, it's psychically healthy because it's cathartic. But the problem is that because it's cathartic, it can also, even if it's politically committed and cathartic, it can also reconcile you to the way things are. Uh, it's not necessarily a motivation for action. It can actually reconcile you to accept. It can, you know, the catharsis make you accept the way things are. What do you think about that, Mosin? Can, can that kind of... It, I think that you know it's possible um, that maybe art or literature um, could make people reconciled. Uh, yet the evidence of every regime that wants people to be reconciled to the way things are, I can't think of any of them which is promoted or allowed literature to flourish. So, yeah. so in the real world test of you know uh, the goodie bag that dictators can deploy. Um, they don't seem keen on the point that it as a way of getting people pacified. Yeah. Um, I think you know it's uh, there's there's a there's a fundamental question of, of human freedom that's involved in art. You know, we uh, every society tells us that there are these rules around every aspect of who we are. You know, um, they tell us that these countries that we belong to actually exist. That the religions that we belong to are unified entities that um, you know our genders are, are clearly defined and our sexuality is along a certain path. And, um, none of this is true, yeah. and uh, uh, and and so in a way, and it's it's interesting this this, this issue of, of uh, humor and, and eroticism. Um, both are related, right? Like if you find something funny. You know you find something funny. You can laugh sort of falsely or something, yeah. but it isn't really funny. Yeah. Similarly, what is erotic to you yeah. is. Yes. Uh,
neurotic uh, threshold beyond which no paddles allowed to go. Um, but you know, the, the, what is erotic to you just is. Yeah. Um, people might tell you that what should be erotic is the following, yeah. um, or that you should not be erotic at all. Yeah. Um, but it just is, and yeah. and so I think that um, you know that that irreverence um, and obscenity yeah. very often get get moved. Yeah. Yeah, because both of those things are scratching yeah. um, at something that, yeah. that people don't want to see yeah. scratched. And in a place like Pakistan, you know, it's very interesting because um, uh, in some ways, when I, when I read uh, Arabic language literature, which I you know, haven't read as widely, obviously, as one should have, um, but I think of some, of some of the books that I find politically very exciting, like the you know, Zala's Season of Migration to the North, yeah. and the description of women and of sex with women and sexuality involving women has very often struck me as quite different to how it is here in Pakistan yeah. and perhaps in South Asia. Mm. And I don't know why that is, um, but um, whereas in our politics we are very you know, deeply terrified of the sexuality of women, in our art um, there's been a lot of very yeah. subtle and nuanced and quite beautiful exploration. Yeah. Not just the sexuality of women by men or of you know from women of men or of you know homosexual love or whatever, um, but all of these sorts of things. And it may be I just have a much more limited knowledge of Arabic language literature, it, or it may be that Pakistan's encounter with uh, the rest of South Asia, with with the broader Indian continent, has colored our our you know cultural yeah. expression, yeah. or maybe you know whatever. Who knows? Um, but I think there is some degree of optimism there yeah. that um, that uh, uh, while I would say you know Pakistan is incredibly problematic, um, you know having had a female prime minister elected twice and having had you know very transgressive and actually quite beautiful accounts of female sexuality in our literature, I don't think are entirely unrelated things. Yes. It's that if there's a door which is, you know, hundred percent shut. Yeah. Here it is perhaps point one percent or point two percent open, and that little opening allows certain things to happen. Yeah. So, so um, in many ways, you know, I I don't hold Pakistan up as a model of societies yeah. to the rest of the Muslim world. I don't think the Muslim world exists actually. Um, I'm not even sure Pakistan entirely does. But <laughs> but I think that I think that um, there are lots of very potent things. Yeah. You know, if you watch a performer like Abda Parveen, you know, perform in a place like Pakistan, this titanic, you know, force of, of, of energy yes. you know, in, in a female, you know, uh, ostensibly female form, um, you're touching on something very, very raw, yeah. and very, very powerful. Yes. And, um, and so, and so uh, um, you know, very often we look at countries that are described as being, you know, fellow Muslim societies yes. or whatever. We gravitate towards a kind of notion that um, that, that very definition means the oppression of, of you know, female sexuality. Yes. Um, it needn't be the case, yes. and I'm not saying Pakistan is more enlightened than other countries or whatever. But I, I know it a little bit, yeah. um, and I see cracks uh, in that in that wall. Yeah. And. Um, and I, I do, I do think that in many ways the most unsettling um, issue in any society is this, is this notion of you know how can women's sexuality be controlled? Yeah. Um, and I think from that standpoint, in our artistic tradition of this part of the world, um, there are strands yeah. that are very firm. And so the last thing I'd say on this is I remember writing my first novel in which um, a young woman chooses to leave her son and her husband. Um, and a lover who's the protagonist, the main protagonist of the novel, and sort of go off and just live her life. And I remember being interviewed by a young woman about this, and she said, why do you think women are villains? Um, you know, your, your novel has this one character, and she's a villain. And I remember, you know, thinking about this, and thinking this is just an interesting question, as if you know, she wasn't a villain to me. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just pause there, but I, I do think that, um, that in Pakistan we should... Uh, of course, be concerned about the current state of, of so many things, yeah. um, but also recognize the richness of of um, uh, directions that yeah. we all have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah.
it's a great um, way for me to remind people that as far as Arabic literature is concerned, there's a, a long and very rich history yeah. of Arabic erotica yeah. that a lot of people have forgotten. Everything from the poetry of Abu Nawaz, who did write love yes. poetry for men and boys, yes. to amazing poetry by Arab women. There's a, there's a great book called Classical, Arab, uh, Classical Poetry of Arab Women, and it looks at poetry by women from the set, I think from the, the Umayyad and Abbasid, and also the Andalusian um, Empire. So we're talking 8th to 12th century, and I mention those because I brought them up in my book, because part of what I do, as I said, I, I write about sex more and more recently, and the, the subtitle of my book is Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. And I quote it, um, I can define a sexual revolution for you. Actually, I'm, I'm going to define a sexual revolution in the Bowie session. So those of you who want to hear it come, because I'm going to do something for the Bowie session. But, but, you know, I also mentioned that, and this, this is also uh, mind-blowing, and it, and it touches on Saudi Arabia. One of the things um, I discovered in Saudi Arabia, in, on the bookshelves of, my, of the university library there, wasn't just feminist journals, which was mind-blowing enough, because, you know, there's no women's and gender studies program at the University of King Abdul Aziz in Jeddah. So some subversive librarian or professor put these feminist journals and books there, which basically literally saved my mind, because they, they gave me a word for what I had been, been feeling. But I also found The Perfume Garden by Sheikh Muhammad Nasseri. I don't know if any of you know what this is, but this is basically the Arabic Muslim Kama Sutra. It begins with, um, in the praise of uh, God, the most merciful, the most beneficent, I thank God for the cock and the cut. <laughs> and then this book goes on to describe all the sexual positions for a man and all the sexual positions for a woman. Now he's obviously a man, a product of his time, so he's much more, he gives men many more positions than, than women get, and he is quite chauvinist. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination calling him a feminist. But there are so many other books like that, and there's a great novel by a Syrian, a Syrian woman whose name unfortunately escapes me, but it's called The Proof of the Honey. And it's a fiction, it's a, a, a fiction, a work of fiction, but it's a work of fiction um, that she uses, Salwa Ali, that's her name. So Salwa Ali uses this novel to go through this very rich history of Arabic erotica. She mentions Sheikh Muhammad Nafsawi, she mentions many others, she mentions all these women who are legends now in Arabic history who are teaching their sons and daughters and are basically kind of like these grand dames of sexuality that talk about I've had a thousand partners and I've done this and that with, in a way that is unthinkable today. And she does this in the novel because she's trying to remind us in the Arabic speaking world, because I also don't think the Arab world exists, and I agree with you, the Muslim world doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the Arab world. But the Arabic speaking countries today have forgotten this heritage, this amazing poetry, where a woman, you know, in the Abbasid Empire writes a poem for her husband telling him, why are you upset that I'm fucking other men? And she writes to her lover saying, come and flush me once and twice, basically kind of like an Abbasid Empire booty call, as we would call it. So all so, these women being incredibly outspoken yeah. in a way that we've lost today, but we have to remind ourselves that that existed and was not considered haram or considered a or all these think, other words. Oh, I think that's important because what I'm picking up from all four of you is that art actually clarifies our sense of ourselves as embodied beings with all its complexity and frail, frailties and um, in many ways, uh, I, I mean, uh, that's part of speaking truth to power. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to um, move to something else because the other thing I noticed in all your writings is that there's a kind of agonistic, uh, tense relationship with the nation state in your writings. And um, uh, I wanted to say, uh, quote something that Barghuti says. He says, writing is a displacement, a displacement from the normal social contract. Um, and he says the poet strives to escape from the dominant used language to a language that speaks itself for the first time. And then he goes on to say, if a, poet, if a person is touched by poetry or art or literature, his soul throngs with displacements and cannot be cured by anything, even the homeland. Not even the homeland. I just wondered if, uh, what does that citation say to you about the writer as, in a sense, always being in exile in, in, within the nation state, which after all is the most dominant political institution of our times. And I thought I'd begin with you, Sreya, because in a way your novels are about the, uh, 
that are about bringing to the surface repressed memories that, uh, you know, traumatic narratives that have been repressed by official national histories. Uh, so I just wondered what all of you actually thought about that. Can a writer ever be completely comfortable with the idea of the nation? know the answer to that, but I know that it helps not to feel comfortable in terms of your relationship with the nation state. At least I have found that in my writing. Being a little bit removed uh, provides a different perspective and the level of discomfort that that um, distance creates is both um, provoking in terms of subject matter and also in terms of form. I think, almost. And that quote that you have just read makes me think of something else that I just recently read in the uh, Nobel, uh, uh, the per Svetlana Aleksevich, who won the uh, prize for literature last year. She wrote this really moving and profound uh, speech, acceptance speech. And in it she talks about, of course, her work uh, is so tied to the nation both her work in terms of Zinke Boys, which is uh, a chronicle of uh, interviews that she conducted with various people who participated in the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, both uh, mothers of soldiers, soldiers themselves, and women who fought during that time. So in uh, her speech, she makes a mention of being interested in I think her term is, she's interested in the history of the soul, you know? And her clarification for that is that she's, uh, she, collects, she collects the history of time and she reflects that in the history of the soul. And she's interested in that vis-a-vis -vis the nation state yeah. and the traumas that the nation state has inflicted yeah. on its people. Yeah. Um, so I think that the narrative of the nation state is critical. For, for many writers, and certainly I feel like that in my own writing. Yes, yes. But n it's not only the narrative of the nation state, it's also what that narrative omits, yes. right? Yes. It's the missing history. Yeah. It's the history that doesn't make it yes. into the, into, um, yeah. the mainstream. Yeah. So yeah, I the think relationship is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think particularly in this part of the world with the legacy of anti-colonial politics, speaking the truth to politics often means speaking the truth to nationalism and what nationalism has excluded, what it's marginalized, what it's repressed, um, including in gender terms, because so much of anti-colonial politics is uh, gendered. Um, so what about you, Susan? Do you think the writing is always an act of displacement? The writer is always, in some senses, in exile, even with, when they're writing about the nation state? Yeah, I, I want to make two points here. Um, you know, you, you sort of jump. You wanted to jump away from sexuality into nation state yeah, trauma, but I think there. I don't think there's really uh, much of a difference. And I think no, I the issue of um, uh, the control of women's bodies and everything that Mona yeah. said is really central to um, to, to subversion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because the control of women's bodies and and, and hello, okay. women's bodies in general are central in every society. Um, and, and sometimes I find that women can be the greatest purveyors of patriarchy. Yeah. Um, in my novel, there is uh, pretty, it's, it's minimal sexuality, but there is some. Yeah. But one of the characters um, is this, she's kind of this foul-mouthed, wise-cracking matriarch. She's a very pious, beautiful um, uh, Muslim woman. Um, and, uh, but she, you know, she gets with her friends. And, uh, and they just, you know, they're foul mouth and the sexual innuendos fly. And I have received um, a lot of objections from Muslim readers about that. Yeah. Because they feel like it's a desecration of, of the Muslim mother. Yeah. And frankly, you know, these women exist in my family. I mean, they exist yeah. in a lot of families that I know. You know, my grandmother used to, you know, she was a hashish, she was pious, she was a wonderful woman. And, uh, you know, she would get with her friends and the ladies and, um, She'd take off the hijab and the train smoking and yeah. the shisha and, you know, and it was wonderful. It was like this yeah. treasure of, you know, these, these, this world of women and I loved it. And, um, and it's so, it's such a minimal, it's such, it's human nature and the, the, the strenuous objections 
to these to this kind of depiction is um, it's it's problematic and it's troubling. Yeah. But I, I want to also make another point um, that art and literature can also be used in a very sinister way too. Yeah. Um, there, it, it's not always this. Uh, it's not always a, a place of uh, of inspiration and provocation and so forth. It's also a, a place where. Um, or art has been utilized to disseminate uh, propaganda. So, for example, you know, if you look at Hollywood and, and the films that depict our part of the world uh, and the way that we are, uh, you know, brown people and black people of the world are, uh, are portrayed in, in such stereotypic um, personas that, that begin to permeate popular imagination and they affect they affect our trajectory as human beings, our, our evolution, our moral evolution as human beings. Um, Exodus, uh, that was um, by um, uh, uh, <laughs> Leon Harris, um, that was, was this really very popular novel that entrenched this propagandistic, <laughs> what kind of word? Um, narrative of Palestine yeah. that it was this empty place and yeah. and these you know European Jews who, who had never have absolutely no connection to Palestine were somehow returning and it was this very romantic um, uh, narrative and there was this myth that became truth yeah. Yeah. and so that's one way that art is also used in, 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 a, in a very sinister um, uh, yeah, way to, 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 to actually promulgate power and promulgate oppression. Yeah. So that's... I think that, that's the important point that, you know, um, certainly in South Asia, nationalism has always been, uh, as I said, heavily gendered. I mean, the idea of Mother India is a very powerful idea and has created all kinds of uh, odd politics, to put it, to put it um, uh, you know, mildly, really. But uh, Mohsen, what do you feel about writing as an act of displacement? And in a funny kind of way, the protagonist of the reluctant fundamentalist is a kind of displaced person who's trying to negotiate the nation versus a kind of transnational fundamentalism and you know the kind of conflicting uh, obligations of that, if I could put it like that. What, what's your view about the writers always being displaced? Uh, I, think, uh, I think nations are a fiction. Yeah. Right. We create this fiction. There's no actual line between India and Pakistan. Yeah. There's no actual line between Pakistan and Iran. We just sort of say, okay, well, here's where Pakistan ends and Iran begins. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, regulate the movement of human beings across this line. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this this barrier which we imagine to exist that we make sort of the impermeable. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not a fan. And uh, and I think you know, in 100 or 200 years, we're going to look back at people who. Um, say that they believe in freedom and liberty and democracy and equality and yet deny the movement of migrants across borders. Yeah. The same way that we look back at people a century or two ago who used to own slaves and say they belong yeah. to democracy. Yeah. I mean, it is a fundamentally uh, uh, invalid position yeah. to argue that some human being, whether they are fleeing their um, you know, oppression or simply just want to move, um, if swallows can do it, and seagulls can do it, and you know, uh, wolves can do it, you know, why can't we do it? And, and so I understand that it's frightening. And, you know, in a way, I think migration is to the nation state what sexuality is in a way to the, the individual dynamics. Yeah. And, and it's very worth looking at, um, at this because um, you know, Pakistan, for example, was founded on, this, on, this, on two things simultaneously. Uh, one was, you know, the sudden division yeah. of this place into two different countries. My, I remember asking my grandfather, what was the biggest event of your life? You know, was it the nuclear bomb? Was it uh, studying in England? Was it um, World War II? Was it? Yeah. He said partition because two thirds of my neighbors left. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he lived in, in Gior, not very far from me. He was an engineer, worked in irrigation. And two thirds of his neighbors moved to another country. Yeah. And, and at the same time, we had millions of people crossing borders. And so you had this division and yet this movement. I mean, yeah. it's, this, it's this deeply confusing um, thing. Yeah. And then it gave rise to this notion of the Mohajir in Pakistan. Yes. Yes. And I don't want to make it very Pakistan-specific necessarily this conversation. But uh, uh, 
in Pakistan today, uh, we too, it's not just that in the West there are people sitting out there saying, you know, all these people are coming to our countries, keep them out. Um, in Pakistan too, there's a deep sense of almost, you could say, betrayal by those who leave or want to leave. Yeah. A dual passport holder cannot hold a government office in yeah. Pakistan any longer. Mm. Your ability to comment on what's happening here is invalidated by the fact that you might live abroad. Yeah. You know, what do you know? Yeah. Um, and, so, and so, in a sense, it's, it's also here that we want to say you must only be Pakistani. Don't leave. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you do leave, you become contaminated. Yeah. And, so, and so I think, you know, in the coming century, we will see billions of people move. It's just going to happen. The rivers yeah. will run dry, the seas will rise, yeah. diseases will come, and wars will come, and billions of people are going to move. And how we address this movement as yeah. human beings, and where, you know, where we locate our sympathies is very, yes. very important. I think and I think literature does this, yeah. because I just want to cl cl close on this notion, is that, is that literature just floats across these boundaries. Yeah. You, know, you walk into reading the bookshop or the Faroe Sons, yeah. you know, right nearby here, and you will find the whole world gathered yeah. on those shelves. Yeah. And that's very important. I think that, 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 that those are great points to end with. That. I think we've got five minutes, so um, that's a kind of important place to end, which is, of course, nations, as Anderson said, are imagined communities, and novels have been used to help the imagining of those communities, but also to expose the frailties of those imaginings and to deconstruct and critique those imaginings. And um, um, I think what you said about the national and the transnational, again, is important. There's a kind of sense in which the nomadic is always a problem for national citizenship. Because there's always an attempt to root nationality in some ways. And nomadic, the travel, mobility, migration is always a challenge uh, to that. And I just, just <coughs> wanted to talk about the future, really. I mean, how, since you've ended on that, is there a sense uh, well, sorry, and also just to say, uh, of course, because you all write in English, necessarily, because it's a world language, your literature is transnational. What you write is transnational. So there is also a kind of politics of choice when you choose to write in a particular language. And that's something we really haven't touched on, that choosing to write in a, political, in a particular language in a multi-lingual uh, region like South Asia is itself an act of political choice. Um, and perhaps we could, um, you know, we might not have time to think about that here. But I just wanted to think about the future, because in a sense, all the issues of justice that you've talked about, climate change, feminism, um, are transnational issues by their very nature. Uh, and so in a sense, if you're a politically committed writer who's committed to justice, you are necessarily, in some sense, being transnational. And, uh, you know, last week, the head of the student union in JNU was arrested and charged with sedition. And I read his speech, and what's interesting about the speech is that he's, one of the things he says is that, you know, let's stop talking about Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, and let's stop talking about poverty, which has no borders. So, and that, I think, is quite interesting that that was, in a sense, what was seditious about his speech, not just his reference to Kashmir, which is to challenge them to say that actually national boundaries are in some senses uh, oppressive. They stop us thinking about things which we need to think about in global ways. What would you say, Mona? Because in a sense, I, I came to this, uh, you know, the session on uh, global feminism. Is it not the case that feminism and and also the, you know the search for economic justice is necessarily transnational? Yeah, we, we got into this argument about should we use transnational or global, which yeah. we will not really. Um, no, you know, I, I will back into that and, and into your question by also asking why um, is love for nation or love for country uh, associated with this kowtowing and like bootlicking and all of this? Whereas many of us, I'm sure many of us, if not all of us on this stage, also believe that love for country or nation or whatever you want to call it comes through a very robust critique. And I say this because, and this, this touches on yeah. feminism, uh, a Belgian journalist told me this anecdote of how she came to interview me because, uh, as Javid said, in, in 2011, Egyptian riot police broke both my arms, sexually assaulted me, and I was detained for 12 hours by the police and in the military. So a Belgian journalist wanted to come and interview me about this, and she was talking to 
are uh, white English journalists, and I very specifically and intentionally um, identify his race, because it's important, and his, his sex. And he said to her, oh, I, I don't interview uh, Monat Bahawi. And she said, why? And he said, well, because she travels, and she speaks English, and um, she doesn't represent the, the, the average Egyptian woman, as if this white Englishman is an authority on the average Egyptian woman. And, you know, further insult, as if the average Egyptian woman also doesn't care about sexual violence and doesn't care about being safe from sexual violence and isn't interested in being free from misogyny and patriarchy. So this idea of, you know, who gets to decide who is the real Egyptian or the real yeah. Pakistani or where the borders are, and, and this idea that there are certain types of women who care about feminism and others who don't, or women's rights, whereas, and I mentioned yesterday, there are feminist movements in China there are femi that, that we've hardly ever heard of. Five women, five women were detained for a month and they become known as the Feminist Five. The Black Lives Matter movement, which I believe is a revolutionary movement in the United States, was founded by three queer black women. And at the heart of that movement is a campaign called Say Her Name, talk about violence specifically directed against black women. And they focus on LGBT issues and, and gender binaries and all of that. So I think it's not just nation boundaries that we have to dismantle. Yeah. It's also gender boundaries yes. that we have to dismantle. Yeah. Good. I think that's it. That, I mean, that's a good place to end. And thank you very much to my panelists. That in the end, literature is about challenging boundaries and speaks the truth to the politics of authenticity. How's that? My students will love that. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much indeed for your. Uh,